Hello, Moto America fans. Welcome to Off Track with Carruthers and Vice. It's Moto America's weekly podcast, which means we do it every week, which makes sense, right, Sean? Makes sense. I can't believe it. every week we do this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I haven't. I haven't looked lately on the the number, but it's two hundred and thirty or something that we've done yeah, up there. Yeah. I can't believe I've had that many conversations with you. <laughs> it's a good thing we record we uh, keep track of the number anyway so yeah right about it yeah <laughs> well today we're today we're looking at doing something a little bit different you know we've got the super super bike championship starting the medallia super bike championship starting up here in what three weeks or something yep uh so i thought you know let, let's talk about super bikes let's let's see what we we all think about who's going to do what and why and kind of throw some things around generate a little bit more interest in a series that's already got a ton of interest because you know there's nothing like the first race because everybody goes into it thinking that they're going to be uh that they have a chance of being a, a moto america superbike champion and as we know there's only a handful of them that actually do have that shot but you know everybody's got a fresh fresh start and new hopes and and we see what they can do so we're going to we're going to discuss that series um, in depth, and to do so, we're going to bring in Roger Hayden, who's everybody knows Roger. He's basically become the face of Moto America Live Plus. Uh, you know, he's he's there every week, every race, and uh, he's just become a fixture. He's he's become quite good at the at the job, which is not an easy job. I can't imagine. You and I, you know, can sit here and talk for an hour a week, but he sits there and, and talks for hours and hours and hours for, you know, three or four straight days. So, yeah, it's incredible. He's become very adept at it. He's good at it. The fans love him. We love him. We're happy to have him. And he's also a good person to sit down and talk to on this Superbike preview show because he obviously is a, a student of racing and, and was a very, very good racer himself. So he's kind of he's kind of comes from a different angle than what you and I do, where we're just, you know, we're guys that wish we could do it, but don't. And he's a guy that's done it. So Roger, uh, welcome to our little podcast here. And uh, I hope you're doing well out there in Kentucky. Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, getting through winter here in Kentucky. So uh, looking forward to, we had Daytona, but I'm looking forward to getting the season really started in a couple weeks. Yeah, it's kind of cool that we do the Daytona thing. And that's like opening day, big deal, Daytona 200, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we have a little bit of a gap to kind of catch our breath. And then all of a sudden it's like we get to build all this excitement again because the classes that didn't run at Daytona now start their championship. So it's kind of two opening days. Exactly. And plus, I mean, Daytona this year with so many riders and it just had so much hype, you know, and it was like so exciting. I mean, the race had eight guys in it that could win. And I think that just kind of gets everybody – fired up for uh, the rest of the season and then also just seeing the spectator attendance at Daytona you know it's been a long time since I've uh, seen the infield that full and uh, so it just gives you that excitement you know more hype and you know more people around just creates a bigger buzz yeah I mean it's it, we always say oh it's you know the good old days and the good old days and and the good old days were good don't get me wrong but I mean I think we're getting back to the point where you know we it, it's not back to the good old days, but it's pretty damn close. I mean, we've got a lot of international riders at the 200. Like you said, there's a bunch of guys who can win. There's a bunch of guys on the lead lap. It's drafting. It's everything that Daytona is supposed to be. And, you know, it, it's only going to continue to get better. Yeah. And also too, I mean, I'm not really used to, it hasn't been like this for a while, but now I'm starting to have to leave my hotel a little bit earlier to get to the track because, you know, there's a little bit of a line to, to get yeah. in. Right. You know, I mean, I'm not waiting forever, but you're not just driving straight through. There's usually, you know, five or 10 cars in, in front of you and they move them pretty quick. But it's pretty cool to see, you know, when it, when you're waiting in line, you don't really like it. But overall, you know, it's great to it's great to see the crowds growing the way they are. Well, that's the thing. It's like, be careful what you wish for. Right. It's like we want a bunch yeah. of people at the races and then but none of us want to get up an hour earlier to go uh, try to get through and. You know, like MotoGP, I mean, you, you you do a MotoGP race in Spain and you're you're up at four in the morning just to get through and get your spot and get in and, and get settled. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, Moto America, all the races have, have gotten to the point now where it's nice when you pull up and you actually do have to sit in line to get through the gate. 
Yeah, and also the the lines aren't like crazy long because of the you know the way the passes are now. I think all the tracks and even the Moto America staff has kind of grown with it. Yeah, right. and they get them through the line pretty dang quick. All right, Sean. Sean, you ready to talk about super bikes? I am. I was just gonna say with with Paul, we've said this before, but you know a lot of times if we're uh, running the riders over to the press conference or back or whatever. It's it's always a good problem when we have have trouble getting the golf cart through the crowd to get get them over to the media center. So that's always a good sign when we get a good crowd like that. So hopefully Road Atlanta is going to be the same way. But you know this is weird this year for us to start. I mean, I, maybe maybe I just my memory is not serving me well. But when when was the last time we started the season in Superbike at Road Atlanta? I mean, it's been coded for so long that this is different. Yeah, it is different, and yeah. I'm, I, my memory's not jumping right into shape either this morning either. But um, yeah, yeah it's North Dakota. You know what though? It's I think Road Atlanta is a good place to start. Me too. It um, I mean, and you know, when we've had Coda races, they 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 I, I don't want to say they just haven't been really a preview of what you can totally expect for the whole year because Coda's kind of itself. It's like it's just different. And especially when we had the Europeans come over and, and, and kick our ass there, yes. you know, Tony and, and Danilo, they come over and they kick our ass and it's at Coda and you kind of like, hmm, well, let's see what happens when we get to road Atlanta. Well, exactly. now we go right to road Atlanta and everybody gets their eyes pretty, pretty open there. Um, R Roger, that's a difficult place. We don't have, uh, we obviously don't have a super bike guy coming in for our first year um, at, at, in the series and going to road Atlanta, but that's got that's an eye opener for those guys when they do come, right? Yeah, especially Road Atlanta. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a fun track. Everybody likes it, but I don't think a lot of people realize how hard it is on a super bike. That first section of the track, you're wrestling the bike, and uh, you know it's one of those places. It's kind of weird. You you'll hear a lot of riders talking about arm pump, and uh, I don't know why it is about that track, but it's definitely. It's definitely different, but it's cool to, to start the series at a track where everybody knows, you know, and kind of come in and got a little bit of a time. And then also nobody's really tested there the off season, So everybody kind of starts on a, a level playing field going into Atlanta. All right. Well, let's let's get started on this. Now, I'm going to tell you real quick what my thoughts are. I mean, we obviously Jake Gagne has become the new king of this class. But yep. Cameron Bobier went to Europe and he's done the Moto2 thing. But it seems to me the big story is it, we, we have Jake Gagne, we have Cameron Peterson, and we have Matthew Skultz, which they are the big three of the Superbike Championship, at least for the last couple of years. Now, what this about, year, what's that? Uh, did you mention Peterson? Yes, I did. Uh, Peter, Peterson, Gagne, and Skultz. So correct. now this year we have suddenly the old school guys coming back. And I mean that by five-time champion Cameron Bobier, one-time champion Tony Elias. And we also have Josh Heron, who was also a Superbike champion. It seems like a hell of a long time ago, which kind of was. And he's coming back on a Superbike. So to me, it's almost like it's a little bit weird that we've, it's like the, the big three have kind of pushed, been pushed aside a little bit as far as, as what's newsworthy. And the the big story seems to be at this point, at least going to Road Atlanta, the other three, which would be Cameron, Tony, and Heron, just because we don't know what to expect. Like with Cameron, Cameron isn't the question. Cameron, I believe Cameron, and you, you can disagree with me or agree with me, um, but I think Cameron's going to be better than he was when he left because he's been fighting for his life for a couple of years. Like, like he'll tell you, it's like when you're in, when you're doing that Moto Two class, it's like every lap is like a Grand Prix, right? So you're trying every lap of every practice, every qualifying in the race, and you're just in a constant battle. So I think he as a rider will be stronger. I think the question with him, and let's just start with him and then we'll bounce back and forth. But I think the question with him isn't Cameron, but like how how close the bike will be and, and you know, how quick of a start he can get off to. I think you're 100% right about Cam. You know, the, the big question isn't going to be Cam's talent, but you know the the bike is it going to be there you know the team is somewhat new to to super bike as well even though they got some guys that have been around super bikes for a while but as a one unit working together 
they're all it's kind of a, a newer team they got last year under their belt so uh you know it's gonna be interesting to see because the um you know i know cam definitely has a talent he's definitely the most naturally talented guy that you know that i raced with for sure in in the uh in the u.s but it's gonna be a different situation for cam this year uh when he moved up to Superbike, he uh, he went to a team that was winning title, and so now it's going to be a, a a little bit different. He's going to a team that uh, hasn't won any Superbike races, so it's going to be a little different situation. But I think that just adds to the excitement to it is the unknown. And uh, Cameron's definitely a great rider. That team was making huge strides at the end of last year, you know, battling for podiums. So um, see what they did this off season, but I think the big thing is how quick can Cam get used to the BMW? You know, it's going to be different than the Yamaha, different than the Moto Two bike. So uh, we're going to see. I mean, he might it might take him a couple races to to get used to it, but you know, Cam is uh, eventually going to figure it out. But the, the big question mark is, uh, you know, can him get used to that bike and gel and feel as good as he did on the Yamaha? Yeah, and and Sean, you can chime in here in a second, but it's like the thing, I I kind of have it in my, and I might be wrong, but I just kind of picture things, at least in the first couple of races, I picture maybe the three guys that are coming back actually racing together, but it might be for third, fourth, fifth, sixth in that spot until until they either get their shit together to the point where they're capable of going Gagne's pace or it's quickly apparent that they're not going to. Does that, does that make sense, Sean? Yeah, boy, I'll tell you, it's, it, there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, Roger hit the nail on the head. The thing that's been strange this year about Cameron Bobier is, I mean, technically we have that team has not even announced their team yet. Although, you know, we've seen the season entry list. It's on our website now. And we know that, you know, they, they've got three riders on that team. And, you know, PJ came on last year on that bike as well. And even in the little bit of testing that we've seen or heard about Cameron doing, he was fast on that bike. But it's a huge unknown. I mean, for him to be on that, you know, it's it's uh, because we've even seen what's going on with that bike a little bit in in World Superbike. Although yesterday Garrett Gerloff went fourth fastest in uh, one of the sessions, so we know the bike is absolutely capable. It's just it's going to be a real eye opener to see where they are at when they start out, and and especially for Cameron. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask Roger about this, Roger, you so you raced for Suzuki and Honda and Kawasaki. You raced for a lot of brands. Did you ever have a situation where you came, you were on a previous brand and had some success and, and then, you know, switched to a different team or different brand. And you felt like for a while it was like, oh, wait, that's my team over there in the other part of the paddock. You know, it took you a little while to get used to being on this different team. Did that ever happen to you in your career? No, no, not really. Because when I, I rode for Kawasaki for so long and then, when I moved from them, they went away. That's when they uh, took their road race team away. That's then right. I went to Jordan Motorsports for a while and uh, was there for a while. And then when I went to Yosh, they wasn't racing no more. So it seems like maybe I'm the common denominator there. It seems <laughs> like when I, whenever I've been switching teams, they've kind of, uh, they went away. So it's not, uh, not been a, not been a huge problem for me or a situation that I'm used to. So Sean, this might be our last podcast because <laughs> yeah. Roger, Roger might have just wrecked our career. <laughs> I have been on I've been on here before. You're still going. Oh, that's, yeah, that's true. What that's I was going to say. Thankfully, he has been on before. So he did, if it would have been wrecked, it would have gotten wrecked before this. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Roger. So you mentioned about Road Atlanta and arm pump, and I'm not trying to necessarily segue into Cameron Peterson, but I did want to ask you. So he had gotten arm pump, or he had gotten that compartment surgery um after testing at button willow and and had it going you know had it done before going into daytona which was pretty incredible that he got it taken care of because there were some complications and you mentioned about road atlanta the arm pump i have a, did you ever have that surgery i can't remember if you did yeah i had it i had yeah. it early on when i was when i was about 18 and then uh 
one year during the season that Yosha I had it I had it done first or second year after Laguna one year I went and had it done. Does it help? Yeah, it does. It definitely helps. Uh for most guys it does. Some it doesn't uh help as much. The good thing about it is it, it kind of heals up quicker than you think now because of technology, even though I'm in cam raced right away at, at Daytona. So uh you know, obviously he did two hundred miles there, but you know, super bike and a super sport bike is gonna be totally different. But it definitely helps and uh, a lot of guys are getting it. Roger should have just had Velcro put put in there. <laughs> had it more than once. Hey, okay, so let's move on to the second guy who's coming back, and that's Tony Elias. Now yeah. you know him better than anybody, Roger, because you were his teammate, um, even the year when he won the championship. Now it doesn't it he's a guy that to me doesn't get old. Like that he just seems like a 20-year-old a kid, and I picture him being that way forever. And and also his throttle hand doesn't seem to get old either. He doesn't seem to scare easily. He's uh, he's obviously got a lot of talent. Now he's coming back with um, the Vision Wheel M4 X Star team that he was with prior. Now, from the outside looking in, I don't think he was real happy uh, with the team, with the bike, or what have you in that in that year that he was with them. And I don't know what's going to be different. And I think with Tony, he has to get off to a good start. He has to get confident. He has to make the bike you know, the way that he wants it. Nobody in the paddock, you know, messes with a bike more, more than Tony. I mean, you can, be, you can go out on hot pit and see, you know, like suspension parts and swing arms laying on the ground that he's, he's actually gone to that degree. So what, what, what's your insight tell you about how you think Tony's going to perform after coming back? Well, I think kind of the same thing we talked about with some of the other riders could possibly be a, a bit of a slow start. I mean, he set out last year, uh, the year before, he only did a couple races. So he's kind of two years out. And uh, even though he's did, you know, some track days, you know, you know, on a stock bike and did some coaching and stuff, it's totally different than, than racing. So I think one thing, uh, I mean, even when he was talking about when he came back testing the first time, you know, his eyeballs were about to pop out of his head. Things were coming up so quick. And uh, so, uh, you know, they haven't did a lot of testing to kind of knock all that rust off and, and to, you know, to get used to it, you know, not doing a lot of testing. Weather hasn't helped either. So I think it's a, another another guy that I think might take a couple races. But the thing is, if you do start a little bit slow, you can get frustrated. You just got to, you know, stay on it. And that, I think Tony really believes in himself. And, um, you know, I know that the Vision Wheel M4 team hasn't had the results they wanted in Superbike the last couple of years, but I think this can be a jump start. You know, bring Tony in with his experience and uh, what Escalante did last year, and hopefully uh, they can sort it out. Now, you would know this because you were in his team the year he won the championship, but I, I just discussed a little bit about how he, he does make wholesale changes to the motorcycle but that year in his years where he was really successful with yosh did he continue to do that or did he find a setup that he liked like most guys do and then just tinker with it well for a little bit i mean he definitely liked to change stuff a lot but you know we was a factory team then and you know the yosh japan we had certain limits that we could stay in you know, for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, about the swing arms. It wasn't like, you know, we design our own or, you know, different, different offsets, offsets. Don't get me wrong. We had a ton of stuff, but, you know, we had a, there was a limit. You couldn't go down a, a, a crazy path. You could change a lot of the stuff each weekend that you wanted. And he definitely, you know, like, like the chain stuff, but at, at the same time, we, you, there was a, parameters that we kind of had to stay in they were a lot of parameters though don't get me wrong i'm not saying there wasn't much to change because there was a lot but you couldn't go down your own path if you wanted right somebody said no at some point yes <laughs> you know you know guys so one of the things i wonder about this time around for tony is when before i mean he went from from yosh to you know the m4 team uh what it was called then now vision wheel m4 x star suzuki um, but it was kind of like he went, he went from 
the Suzuki to the Suzuki. And I think he had a lot of feel for the bike at Yosh. And, you know, he's been a couple of years away from that bike. Now the bike's probably developed more than it was there, but maybe he's not going to come in there and go, I want it to be just like it was last year. Cause last there wasn't a last year for him. Do you think there's anything about that Roger that it's going to be different now? Maybe. Well, I think I'm sure they probably talked about where things kind of went wrong the first year they were, were together and uh, probably, you know, John and Chris have a ton of experience as well, and they've run a lot of successful programs. So I'm sure they probably have a game plan going into the year and, uh, you know, try to sort that out. But Tony's definitely, uh, man, he's, he's pretty incredible on the bike. And there's sometimes some races you think he's out of it, and uh, here he comes. So I definitely – he definitely has a talent. And I also think he's going to be motivated. You know, when you set out for two years and it's not by your choice – now he gets this opportunity to come in and show everybody, you know, what you were missing out, why you should have signed me the last two years, and then also moving forward. So he, he doesn't want to retire. So he's got a he's got a lot to prove, and I think he's going to try his hardest to prove it. And I think Tony's going to bring his best this year. All right, let's move let's move on to Josh Heron, the third guy who's coming back and also a previous champion. Now when I Josh is moving from, you know, he had a very successful last year. He cleaned up on the super sport bike and he was rewarded with a, a super bike ride for this year. Josh is one of those guys. I mean, we, we all know how talented he is, but we also, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm alone in this. I don't think I am, but there's, there's times when I, I couldn't tell you if he's going to win by 15 seconds or finish seventh. And it's not that he's inconsistent, but he but he can be, and I think sometimes he can be his own worst enemy. Now, going into this season, I I can tell by how hard he's been training. He's he he'll tell you that he he hasn't been a guy that's been big on training, but you can see this year. You know, if you look at his Strava, he's been riding bicycles basically every day. He's been putting it in good miles. He's been you know he's doing some altitude stuff and, and he's, he seems to be doing all the right things for a guy that's got an opportunity to race a superbike. Now, what I wonder from you, Roger, and I don't know if you've been in this position or not, I don't think you have, but he's, he's basically going from being on teams where he's the second superbike guy and his teammate is the one that's expected to, to do the business. Now, he's alone on a team and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for you to be your only guy. I don't know if you need help with setup or I don't know if it's motivating to have a teammate or if you think everything's okay just by yourself. Well, I think sometimes it's good to have another teammate because when you kind of got a question about something, if you have a good teammate that you can work well together, you can ask a question or, you know, when you're the only rider and you're struggling with something, and you tell the team and they might think, well, you know, just maybe it's not, maybe it's you. Well, when you have a teammate, you're both saying the same thing. The team has to address that area. So it's obviously, you know, a problem for whatever it is. So I think it's it's good. It has, a, you know, good points. And then also, you know, your the bad points. But I think what you said in the beginning is, you know, the inconsistencies a little bit, um, and and Josh knows that I'm actually working with Josh a little bit this year as a coach. And, uh, you know, all those things that you brought up, for the most part, he, he kind of has a pretty good idea and he, and he wants to, to work on that stuff. And uh, he has been motivated and lost weight. I think the biggest thing for him might be the lack of track time on the bike right. before the first race. Yeah, he rode the – you know, the V2 last year, this is totally different. That's going to bring nothing. I don't think anything what he learned last year really over to a super bike because the super bike and the super sport bike, it doesn't matter what it is. It's so different. The last time he rode a super bike, it was a Suzuki or a Yamaha, which is going to feel totally different than the, the Ducati. So I think his big hurdle, and we, we talked about this with some other guys is, might take a few races to figure it out. But I think Josh is uh, really kind of looking at himself and, uh, 
you know, he has a lot of experience now. And I think that's what kind of, you know, when you get older, like, like, you know, kind of Josh is now you're, you're okay to, to look at yourself. You know, I think we all did that at a certain point in our, our career. And at some point when I talked to him, he, he kind of, he kind of admitted that like, maybe not having a teammate could be a good thing for him because I think he's the type and I you probably all naturally this way, but I think he was the type that would come in and he'd look at the timing screen and he's focusing perhaps too much on the teammate that's ahead of him or slower than him or whatever, instead of focusing on himself. And he's kind of, he told me that like, he thinks not having a teammate make him can just focus on him and not worrying about what the guy on the other side of the tent's doing. Well, obviously that, I mean, that's, kind of going back to the point where he knows that he needs to just focus on himself. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you know, and, uh, you know, just there, there's just a lot of little things that I think he's going to work on this year. And, and uh, you know, he's going to be a little bit different, but racing is more exciting when Josh Heron is at the front. There is yeah. absolutely no doubt about that. Um, yeah. I think we saw that a couple of weeks ago. He's aggressive. Um, you know, he's not there to make friends. And uh, it makes it exciting to watch. Okay, well, I'm going to put this one on Sean. Sean, yeah. let's talk about Jake Gagne. Okay. Wow, Go Jake, for it. Jake Gagne, my gosh. I mean, Jake Gagne, Jake Gagne became what Cameron Bobier was. And it's almost like he stepped, I don't know, he stepped up because Cameron wasn't there anymore. Did he step up because it was his time? Did he be, f finally become healthy with his leg situation? But he seems to be pretty unbeatable. I mean, obviously the wins that he's put together and with that team and, you know, now even more so with Cameron or with Cameron Peterson there to, you know, on that team, they get along so well. And I think, it, I think you talk about a teammate and how they can help you. I, I think those guys push each other pretty well. Plus, I mean, he's obviously going to want to be like, well, okay, the guy that used to have this ride is now back again. He's on a different bike, but I, I've got to show that, you know, he, him, on a different bike I'm still I'm still the man so it, it's going to be interesting to see and you know I mean Jake's been riding riding a long time um and and understands riding you know he he went over last year and raced in world superbike too so um I, you know he's obviously the guy to beat um I want to mention something I want to go back and mention something about Heron for a minute though because it's funny Roger and and Paul you guys have, had pointed out that thing about him being by himself he's had a lot of success when he's only been the one rider on that team. I mean, look at what he did with um, Richard Stanboli. I mean, he still has the track record at, at uh, Laguna Seca and I know it's a different bike now, but one question I wanted to ask uh, to Roger and it's, it's about last year with these well-documented issues that, that Daniela Petrucci had with that bike and those Dunlops. And it's not something that Heron, I mean, Josh Heron doesn't covet Pirelli tires. He doesn't think, maybe that that bike isn't good with Dunlops. He's a Dunlop rider and has been. So do you think, what do you think Roger about all of that when it shook out regarding Danilo? Do you think he talked about that a little bit too much? And do you think that's going to be any kind of a factor? It does that bike, is that bike hard to ride on Dunlop tires or maybe not so much this year because they've had some time to develop it. I know that's a lot, but what do you think about that, Roger? Well, I don't know. I, you you used to hear a couple of years ago that Dunlop made their bike around the Yamaha. And I don't, I don't believe that. Um, now do I believe that maybe it took him a while to get used to the way that the Dunlops feel because it's going to be totally different than, you know, what he's ever had before possibly. But I don't, I mean, it's hard to, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to, it's hard to criticize, but you know, it's just, I don't know if that can be the case. I think, you know, it worked on the Suzuki. Uh, Josh didn't have a problem with them on the V2. Again, the Superbike and Super Sport is totally different. But, um, you know, for one, Josh can't go into the season thinking that, you know, because then it's in your head. And then if you have right. a bad half day at a track or track day or testing, and then you're going to start planting that seed in your head. So you got to go into the gear and thinking that, uh, you know, your your tires and everything is just that they're going to work great on your bike as well, whether it's true or not. You definitely can't go in thinking that. 
So, so Paul, Paul, back to back to Jake Gagne again for a minute. The guy, the guy's unbelievable with his his the mind game that he has. And I'm not saying he plays mind games. I'm saying his his thought process inside his head is he's just so chill and cool as a cucumber all the time that he just is, is coming into the season with all kinds of confidence. I think, I mean, why would he not? It's just going to be continuation. You know, you wonder, okay, you got Cameron Bobier and, and you got, you got Josh, you got Tony, Josh Heron, you got Tony, but you know, he's got his own, his own teammate, Cameron Peterson, who's showed clearly he was coming on last year. So I don't know if he, he doesn't seem to be affected by any of that stuff. Do you think? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Jake's a unique individual. I mean, he's like, he's like, he said, he's so chill. He's so calm, but I think there's a lot of stuff burning inside there that you don't really see. But I think when it, when it, when he puts the helmet on, he's a different person. It's like, he's like, he's like the nice guy down the street, but the guy's got dead bodies in his basement. You know what I mean? Jake's kind of like that. And not that, not that he's a murderer, but you know what? He does murder these guys on the racetrack or he has for right. two years. But right. The, the the thing I'm curious to see is what what the presence of Cameron Bobier has has on not only Jake but everybody because he does come with he comes with a certain amount of star power now and and I think that's what that's what racing internationally does for you no matter if you succeed or you don't succeed and he had a lot more success than people give him credit for. Uh, yeah. You know, you don't set a lap record and be on pole position at, at Coda on a Moto2 bike if you don't know what you're doing. So, That's true. so it's going to be interesting to me. Like, I think Cameron Bobier, and he's not that he, he, without trying to be so, he's got that. He's, I think he now has a bit of that star power. When he walks around the paddock, he's somebody, you know, not that he wasn't anybody before, but he's somebody more now. And I'm curious to see how everybody reacts to that. But, but but Gagne seems to me like the guy that would react the least to it. I, I, what do you think about that, Roger? Well, I think Jake, and I mean, especially him, because he's been dominating the last two years. Really, nobody has really put up a fight in the last two years, if I'm honest. Last lap battle to the to the flag. And uh, and then Jake has to hear, you know, the the critics that say, well, Tony's not in the class no more. Josh Hayes is in the class no more. Cam Bobier's not there no more, which was the big one people would say. Now here's his opportunity to come in and beat the guy that everybody keeps saying, since he's not there is the reason why you're winning. Not everybody's saying that, but some critics are do say that. And uh, I think he's going to have to be coming in with a lot of motivation to – to win, to beat uh, Cam Bobier, and uh, to to beat him straight up, and I think it's going to be exciting. And also, I don't think Jake really, as a rider, I think Jake knows what he's doing. It's not because uh, Cam Bobier left. Right. He's breaking all the track records. He's breaking all the race records. His race times are way faster, like overall. And I think he just has tons of confidence, and I think he's coming in with tons of motivation. Right. All right. That brings us that brings us to Gagne's teammate, right. Cameron Peterson. Now, this kid, well, I guess he's a kid. Well, they're all kids to us, right, Raj? But right. the um, I mean, he he's very he's obviously very talented and can I think he could ride any motorcycle that that he threw his leg over. And this is gonna be his second, yeah, it's his second year, right? Second full year on that team. Uh, I think he had a great year last year, considering he was learn learning the ropes. But I think now he's probably to the point where he believes that he's ready to step up and challenge uh, the rest of the guys, beginning with his teammate for for a superbike championship. Well, also, I also it's the, Go ahead. the question I have is: Is he going to make that jump like Jake Gagne made his second year? Exactly. On that? It's a little unfair, though, to to put that on him and say, Hey, can you make that same jump? Because that jump that, that Gagne did was just incredible. That's like not something that happens very often at all. Somebody make that huge of a leap. I think the big thing for, uh, Kane Peterson, obviously he's got the talent and he, you know, God, what a great guy. Love the opportunity that he's getting. He deserves it. Um, 
that's just one thing, you know, that just, just really like him and just hope, just glad he's having the opportunity that he's having. But one thing I think sometimes, and this is easy to do when you get put on a team that's used to winning, you kind of put too much pressure on yourself. Right. And you start for, trying to force things. And then mistakes happen. And then you're like, man, I got to get out of this mistake, you know? Like, And so I think if he can not put all that pressure on himself, and um, and I think he kind of figured that out as the year went on, right? Some mistakes early on in the year that he wasn't making at the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. With with Cam Peterson, you're, this this idea that he's like the number two rider. Well, I mean, I don't think that sets well with him. As much as he he loves his teammate and his good friends with Jake Gagne, I mean, there's there's a fire burning there too. And and you know, obviously, his commitment to uh, to racing with this getting this compartment surgery done because he just felt like he needed that little bit more edge um, as he as he discovered some issues with Buttonwill and said, I got to take care of this because this is this is my year. And, and it is a, it is a great opportunity for him. It's, it's amazing to think that a couple of years ago, you know, he was, he was on the verge of not being, not racing anymore and kind of was out of racing completely, but, you know, turned it all around and, and here he is. And, and, you know, that team until that team is, is, is knocked off the pedestal, that team is the number one team. And I know, you know, they, they all work hard within that crew. You know, obviously Jake is the, defending champion but they give they give Cameron Peterson as much on that team as they give to Jake so you know I think Cameron probably feel Cam Peterson feels like you know if him if not him then why not me kind of thing so it's it's just it's just going to be interesting to see I mean you know with the guys we've we've talked about so far um it just seems like we're gonna it's going to be so eye-opening when we get to road Atlanta and see and another one and I want to I want to bring this guy up I want to bring PJ Jacobson up because he had a pretty decent year last year he had a he had a pole position um he had that that sneak pass on Petrucci last year at Bar Barber um he's he's kind of the incumbent on that team and has had longer a little bit more time on that BMW and you know he's still got a pretty big chip on his shoulder it'll be interesting how having Cameron Bobier on that team will help PJ or hurt him we're not really sure but you know he's still got something to show and if that team is what we think it is and if that bike it has has what we think it can have then you know he could he could be right there among the the group as well um roger do you you, where do you think pj is going to be this year well i think you said a lot of it that was right he has a i think he has a chip on his shoulder he was out for a year we talked about a couple other guys having that that same issue man i was really bummed out when i thought uh cam peterson or not cam peterson but pj was maybe not going to get a ride this year yeah last year i don't think there was one person who rode harder than pj and maybe he was getting everything out of that BMW and then some, and sometimes too much of it. And he was trying so hard and uh, you could see it in his riding. He was riding great, but you could see he was giving it all. There was no, nothing left. So uh, I think for him now with, with Bobby on the team that they can elevate each other, you know, have that teammate that might be a little quicker than you testing and, you know, get to look at his data and, and kind of, go back and forth with each other. And then, you know, also second year on the the team, I think, you know, they can kind of figure out where they struggled at last year and carry that over to this year. But I definitely think PJ has a lot of motivation. It looked like it last year. And, uh, you know, he was, he was awesome to watch last year and glad to see him coming by. All right. This guy, this guy probably is the most difficult guy for me to talk about. And that's Matthew Skoltz. Now, the reason for that is I can sit here right now and I can't tell you if he's underachieving or if he's overachieving. And that's a weird dynamic, right? Like, is he underachieving because he's not on a factory bike? I'm sorry, is he underachieving because he hasn't done what we all thought he would do and give those guys more of a challenge at the front consistently race to race? Or is he overachieving because he's doing as well as he is without a full factory bike? So, Roger, well, where do you look at that? Well, it's it's hard to it's hard to say. I mean, it's easy sometimes when you're the outside looking in, it, it looks easier or or different than it is. But mm-hmm. I think 
I think that's a really good team. I think it's a really good bike. They got a lot of good people there. Don't, you know, last year they made it, you know, bought a lot of attack parts. This year they have, you know, new electronics. So I think they definitely have the bike and the team and, and the resources. I mean, that they want to win. There's no doubt about it. They, they want to win. And, uh, you know, I think the big thing, like you mentioned, was the consistency. You know, it's kind of some some years he kind of starts out really strong and then in the middle might, you know, have a couple off races and then toward the end of the year uh, comes back strong again. And I think that's just the, the, the thing for him is just being consistent every weekend. And he definitely has the talent. I mean, you can look what he did when he in 2017 when he was on the stock bike. I mean, he was right there behind all the super white guys, you know, just a couple seconds back. And so he definitely, definitely has, definitely has the talent. Uh, he's put in some incredible rides before and, uh, you know, just being that consistent and then also taking that next step. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I want to, I want to talk about that team. One of the things I, I kind of found out over this off season that I didn't realize. So, you know, you think when people, when, Teams and riders within a within a series are on the same brand. Obviously, the bikes are not always the same. And I know there's a lot of attack components on the Westby Racing um, R1, which Roger pointed out. But one thing that was different last year that that I didn't know about until this off season is they were they were like a generation or two behind on the firmware, the Morelli electronics on it. So they were not able to manipulate the electronics and do quite as much as uh the attack team and and i don't know you know it's 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 arguable how much of a difference there really is but from what i've i've heard from talking to ed sullivan the crew chief on that team they have that firmware update now and they've been testing it this year and dialing some things in so they are on the same level elect for electronics as the attack team this year which is something they hadn't been before so we'll it remains to be seen i know a couple of years ago there was a situation where this is going back to a few years when um, the Westby team didn't have the full Morelli, Morelli electronics. So, you know, Matthew was very much a proponent of, you know, wanting to get there with that. So they invested in the system. Well, then, you know, the system, they didn't have the upgrade that attack had. So, you know, one of the things Matthew has always looked for is to try to get on kind of equal equipment a little bit. One of the things that's, that's not maybe equal and that's not to disparage anything about the swing arm on the Westby bike, but I know, you know, Matthew, I've heard he covets that, that billet swing arm that's proprietary that attack performance uses on both Jake's and Cam Peterson's bike. So, you know, sometimes it's one of those things where, do you see that somebody's got something else and you think, am I going to be better? I, I would be better if I was going to be on that. Or it's just like, don't worry about it and just ride the bike. But I have heard this year that the, these electronics have already made a difference for, for Matthew. He's, he's going quicker. Um, he's got better control of the bike on the edge of the tire. Um, and uh, you do engine braking uh, better. There's a lot of stuff on it that's just better than than it was before. So again, we're gonna find out when we get to Road Atlanta what what this all all means because you know it's it's minute changes, but it makes every bit of difference when you're on the edge of riding a, a super bike at full speed like those guys are. So um, it'll be interesting going into it. Yeah, every little bit is is huge. I mean, if you talk about over a lap, you know, a track with a lot of corners, if it makes you a little bit better in each corner than over the lap, it's going to make a huge difference. But, you know, you just got to go into the air and not worry about what everybody else has. Right. You know, um, go and, you know, try to beat them and, and prove that, you know, that you're better without all that stuff. And I think for them, uh, you know, they're from what I hear, their their bike is pretty close. So we'll see. I think another guy, you know, wants to come in. I think Matt's got to be motivated this year to to reel off some wins and definitely has the the potential to do it. All right. I think that we're getting close to being out of time here, but I think we'd be remiss to not talk about two more guys. And that's, you know, that's not disrespecting guys that we won't get to talk about. But uh, I think we have to talk about Richie Escalante and I think sure. we have to talk about Hayden Gillum. Now, Richie Escalante, I think that both of you would agree. I mean, it, it, you're not you're not going to find a nicer guy in the paddock, except for maybe Hayden Gillum. But anyway, Richie Escalante doesn't complain. He goes about his business. 
I think he takes it all in. I think he processes it. And I think he's the type that's going to continue to get better and not just stall out at some point. And I think this year is going to be a very big year for him. Last year was obviously his rookie season in the Superbike class. He had some great races. He made some mistakes that, you know, we can expect a, a rookie, you know, with that much on the line and that much pressure is going to make. Where do you see Richie at this point in his career, uh, Roger? I think just the last year he was really coming on strong. I mean, if you look at it, he was making some mistakes early on. And then when he got hurt at Brainerd, I think it was, he was making huge strides. And I think that's setting back a little bit. You know, I think for him having that rookie year and hopefully, you know, you it's hard when you're a rookie and you move to Super Bike because you want to prove you proved everybody and proved to yourself you're one of the guys you know and it's easy to most guys do have a, their first year of a lot of mistakes and Richie had a couple and I think now even with Tony coming in as his teammate they get along well um, I think they can work well together and I think Richie can make a huge step and you know the team can make a huge step too it takes both right and that brings us to Hayden Gillum. Sean, I know how you feel about Hayden Gillum, how the rest of us feel. I mean, he's 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 a he's a wonderful guy and and he's one of those guys to me that just continues to surprise me. Like you kind of push him to the back burner and then he pushes himself right up to the front and you push him to the back burner and there he is again. And he's obviously a very gifted motorcycle racer and I don't think there's a guy in the paddock that it, when it comes down to like having to really push through something, you know, it'd be hard to bet against that guy from, from, from making it work. Yeah. I mean, it's funny about, about Hay Hayden, you know, when we saw this at Daytona too, but I always have to chuckle about some, you know, he'll tell you, I mean, obviously he's so devoted to his wife, Summer and his, his son Stone and thinks, you know, I got a family to worry about, but then he does what he does at Daytona. And, you know, he was so upset about how things fell out at the 200. And we know, we know, obviously Richie Escalante has got some, had some issues there too. So man, those guys are both coming into road Atlanta and they're just going to be on fire. I think, you know, they're and and Hayden arguably as well, as good as he is on a super sport bike. I mean, they've got another they've, a year under their belts with that team with disrupt racing and, you know, Hayden, Hayden's working on that bike all the time. And I, I think he's absolutely going to be a factor. We've seen what he, he was doing in stock 1000. So, I mean, you know, the bike is just so much better um, as he continues to ride it. So um, I really expect him to do some things and Hey, he's from Owensboro too. So Roger, right. what do you have to say about your boy? Well, I mean, Paul talked about how talented he was. I mean, you go back to Daytona a couple of weeks ago. He was top three in the bagger practice and top three in the Daytona 200 practice. Yes. First practice. Those can't be two totally different bikes. And, uh, you know, last year he impressed a lot in, in Stock 1000. That team kind of, you know, their first, I think, full year in Moto America. And, and there was a couple mistakes and not – you know, he might have won the, the Stock 1000 title. And I think for him, you know, was out for a while. And uh, last year he was riding a, a Stock 1000 and they had a super bike. And I think that can be a little bit difficult when you got two bikes that are really close but not the same. And then also for the team to, you know, it's an extra bike that you have to, you have to, you know, take account for it. And I think, for them having the year, talk about a guy that doesn't have all the bells and whistles of a super bike. They have some super bike parts, but it's they don't have as many as, as the other guys for sure. And, uh, you know, for him, I think there's nobody riding better right now. You come from Daytona and what he did last year, and can be uh, see what kind of huge step that he can make th this year. And I think his goal is going to be to tag on to the, the other Suzuki's and see. See, they can't be the top Suzuki guy this year. Yeah, and I also like the fact that Hayden kind of shoots a hole in that, you know, dads can't be fast thing because, <laughs> you know, there's there's always that that feeling, oh, it'll slow them down when they have kids. It's what it, my dad always said, like I, I had to, I had more mouths to feed. You know, you got to make money. It's more, <laughs> it's it's not bad pressure that it puts on you. It's like it's good stuff. You gotta you gotta do the business to make the money and and take care of your family. Right, you got to buy diapers, right? That's right. Diapers and food, it's not cheap anymore. Not that it ever was, but 
Hey, hey, Paul, I got a question for Roger, which is another writer we haven't mentioned. And I'm just going to, I'm not even going to preface it. I'm just going to mention the name and ask Roger to evaluate. Roger, Ashton Yates. Uh, I think for him is kind of, we talked about some other guys without a lot of experience, just a little inconsistency. Uh, you know, also some bad luck, like one year that the Honda didn't come out till late. This year, I think it's going to be a telling year for him. He's going to be on the same team for the second year, and they're right. going to have a better starting point going into the going into the year at all the tracks. So definitely has a talent. We've seen him right there, top six in some of the Super Bike races. So we'll see uh, this year. I think it's going to be a big one for him. Yeah, and there's rumors around that team that there's a possibility that they may finally make the commitment and, and get that new bike. Uh, you know, they're kind of it's kind of a little bit of wait and see. We don't we don't really know as we talked about with Cameron Bobier and, and PJ is we're not really sure about that bike in its newest iteration this year, the 2023 M M1000RR. But that team may finally make the jump to that bike. But I think you're right. He's going to benefit from a second year. He's got his uh, dad and his grandfather on the team. Uh, with him again so there's a lot of comfort there and you know road atlanta obviously is his home track too he's a georgia boy so um it'll be interesting to see what goes on with that team they're always a little bit of an unknown and that's another one of those like westby racing where you wonder if ashton yates could benefit if if matthew skoltz could benefit from having a teammate to share data with we we've never we haven't seen that with either of those riders yet and, uh, you know, it would be interesting to, to see if that could ever happen someday. Maybe they ought to be on a team together or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's uh, I know we give Shivey a lot of crap about that old bike. Yeah. But damn, I still think I still think your motorcycle needs to be younger than your rider. <laughs> anyway, that's just me. That's right. Um, hey, Paul. So one other thing I want to talk to Roger about, I know we're running out of time, but Roger, so I generally end these podcasts by doing a little bit of a spiel about, well, usually it's corner workers. And again, we need corner workers for Road Atlanta. So go to the Moto America Volunteers page. But I want to talk to you, Roger, a little bit about Live Plus because, you know, we're, we're obviously pushing subscriptions and I've made a lot of uh, appeal, you know, pleads to people people about cut cut the cord consume your uh entertainment the way you want to you don't need to be a slave to what's on tv you can you can choose your your apps and choose your subscription do and do what you want and people that subscribe to live plus get man wall to wall roger hayden with that his insight that he provides it's it's incredible i mean it's fantastic but from an insider's point of view roger tell us about Live Plus, your take on it, what you think of it, especially from a rider that when you raced, you didn't have something like that. So I bet you wish you did, huh? I definitely wish I did because you can go back and watch the practices and the qualifiers and see exactly, you know, where, what everybody was doing, how consistent they was, or were they making mistakes, uh, different lines and all that. So it would be great to – and then go back and watch the races as easy as it is. And, you know, I stream a lot of sports. I mean, NASCAR, football, I mean, everything. And there's not a streaming app. And I'm not saying this just because I, I work there. There's not an easier streaming app than a Moto America Live Plus one. As soon as you click the button and it comes up, it's it's working. You know, my dad watched my mom, and they're not real handy on the phone or the iPad. And they never had an issue or needed somebody to come up there and, and help them get on where some of the other racing apps, somebody always had to come help them. So that's one thing I think that's great for it. And you just get to see all the action. You get to see all the practices and all the qualifiers. Even if you don't sit there and watch it, you can at least have it on as, as background noise. And, you know, for guys that do club races or track days or, you know, amateur racers, you can, you can learn a lot by listening and watching, not just us listening to the riders and how they approach each session if you're a young guy or a track day guy what's a better opportunity than watch live plus and see what the pros are doing during practice qualifying and then try to emulate that and also just the racing the last couple of years has been incredible and uh you know I, one thing for me it was it's way harder than i thought to talk all day but it's awesome to see see it growing and it, it's great for the sport all right, boys. You must, but you must, before Roger, you must walk, Roger, sorry, Paul. Roger, you must walk through the paddock. What is it? 
Are you more popular now as a live plus guy than than you even were as a rider? Is it about the same? Where what's it like when you walk around the paddock? Do people just go crazy when they see you? Uh, no, it's about the same. But I don't really get to walk around the paddock. Right, he's stuck. <laughs> I mean, all day. So I get like you know, I get some messages on Instagram like, "Hey, I was hoping to bump into you this past weekend, but I didn't see you." But I'm like, "Well, you know the." who you heard on the loudspeaker that was me you know i'm like i'm in a in the booth all day so i don't really get to walk around until till the end of the day when when most people are gone basically we just slide food under the door (laughs) yeah yeah it's funny sometimes we don't even get that exactly (laughs) yeah paul sometimes it's funny right we see roger a lot of times he'll walk past where we're sitting and go into that room and then we don't see him the rest of the day and then he comes out of there and it's like Oh, hey, Roger, how are you doing? You know. So. Yeah, I, I, I think I saw him more before he worked for us than when he did. Yeah. 100%. Okay, I got I got one question, and then I'm going to let you go. I know you're a big sports fan. So are my San Diego State Aztecs going to win this Final Four thing? I, I hope they win tomorrow night. I do hope that. Uh, they have been playing good, but I don't think – I think UConn – I think UConn has got it. All right. Oh, Wow. Roger. I don't have a dog in the fight. I would like to see an underdog win it, but I just think UConn has the coach and the team. So we'll see. All right. Yeah, with they... that, up, with that, we'll let you go. Are you, Sean, you're good? Yeah, I'm good, except now I'm concerned. Well, I'm not concerned. I, I'm rooting for SDSU because of you, Paul. But, uh, you know, as a Syracuse fan, I cannot stand the University of Connecticut. <laughs> they're better now that Jim Calhoun's not there. But just to hear Roger say they're going to win it all, it, oh, I, I will die if they are the national champion. <laughs> so, I, can, I can tell you one thing. As a lifelong San Diego fan of everything, they will make it painful. Yeah. Like if they do win, it'll be by the skin of their teeth, or they'll lose by the skin of their teeth, but they'll somehow make it so that you know my heart beats too quickly. Hopefully they win by more than three. Exactly. <laughs> All right, boys. Thank you. Um, that was a lot of fun. And I think uh I think our listeners will enjoy some hopefully some good insight into the series that maybe they learned some things that they didn't already know. So You guys take care of yourselves, and uh, Roger, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. See you, Paul. Thanks. See you, Roger.